So I was a little hungry this morning, and so I might have a burger or a fry or at some point. How many have ever had a Happy Meal? Yeah. My brother Tim, uh, he was, honey, you got to film this whole thing? That's okay if you do. It's perfect. Yep, it's okay. I, uh, but you, so my, uh, my brother Tim, he's gone on to be with the Lord now, and uh, God rest his soul, but he, he would, uh, I guess when they were first married, didn't have a whole lot of money. So when he went to McDonald's, everybody got a Happy Meal. Everybody in the car. How many we got in the car? Seven, seven Happy Meals. And I said, Tim, that's a little embarrassing. He said, no, not at all. He said, also, everything is in there that you need. How many have ever experienced a Happy Meal? If you haven't had one, you bought one for your grandson, then you ate most of it. <laughs> so in there is going to be uh, a hamburger. And there's going to be French fries. And they're really good French fries. They're not good for you, but they really taste good. And there's going to be something to drink, and they're going to be a toy. How many know that? And when I take my grandson Carter there, he's more interested in the toy than anything else. What's the toy? That's what really matters. So we're going to just, that's the, we're going to talk about the Happy Meal today. Are you excited now? So if we could put up that scripture up there. Uh, from Isaiah, if you would. And the first thing I want to tell you this morning is that the, the event that happened at Calvary was really a good thing for us. I would agree with that. But the event that happened at Calvary in the mind of God happened long before Calvary. In the book of Revelation, it talks about before God ever made a man, before he ever made a world, and before he ever formed you and I, long before that ever happened in his mind, the scripture says there was a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world were ever made. He knew about you and I. He knew you'd be a mess. Can anybody say Amen. But he still thought you were worth it. He, and how many know that? You know, I remember we grew up with my dear grandmother, Brother Jim and I. And uh, she loved both of us. Matter of fact, I'll never forget the day. I think I was 15. Maybe he was 16. She brought us in. I, I think it was in that old living room up there in Sweden Valley and set us down. But I'll never forget it. And she looked at us and said, now both of you boys are called to love people. I'm thinking, what does that mean? That means you're going to be pastors. I said, nope, not me. I'm hungry now, and I'm not going to be hungry later. We're poor. We were so poor, our chickens were leaning up against the barn. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to do it. If this is preaching the gospel, it means you're going to starve to death. I'm going to do something different. I said, besides, I don't even want to be a Christian. I was 15 years old. I wanted to be the Marlboro Man. That was much more appealing to me. You know, come riding on the horse and the hat cocked sideways and the world that you, you know, I wanted to be that. And uh, she said, both you boys. And, and he, this one is a mess. I mean, when I met him, he had a switchblade. That was 15 years old. I met a cousin I didn't know I had. Had his hair slicked back, leather jacket on, had a switchblade. I said, now, now we're talking. That's what... And uh, it wasn't two weeks later, he had that switchblade to somebody's throat. And I said, my cousin may be a little crazy. But God, he turned us, and there we were, the both of us. His father, the chief of police, and my dad, the pastor, and two of the little biggest brats in the town. She said, both you boys are called to love God. And then, then she said something I'll never forget. She said, there's only two kinds of people. In the world. Now, see if that doesn't see this is pretty much sum it up. You're either climbing out of the hog trough or climbing in. <laughs> That's it. There was no in between with grandma. And when grandma found Jesus, it was over. Now, let's look at the scripture together. Ready? He, now, this is a scripture from the Old Testament. Isaiah, the Jewish prophet, is prophesying, prophesying about an event 
that's going to happen thousands of years later. But when he says the event, see, scriptures always match up, by the way. You're not going to get in the scriptures and get one to say one thing. If you really look, it's going to always agree. He has to prophesy what was written in Revelation. He can't say he will be, right? Because the lamb was slain when? So it's pretty powerful when you think about it. He says, he was wounded for my transgressions. How many have ever kind of broke the law? Now, I know when we're talking about the law of the land here, pretty much everybody here qualifies. You know, most people, people used to come to my church and they'd say, tell me about your church. I said, well, that man back there, he's a farmer. He'd been farming for many, many years. Wonderful man. This fellow over here, he's been a deacon for years. And that's, you know, this man, he's a wonderful fisherman. And when you come here to Brother Jim's church, it's like this. Well, he got 60 felonies over there. <laughs> that boy just got out of prison over there. How many know a, 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 a hospital, that's what the church is, not a social club. It's really a hospital. You all limped in. Yeah. Ought to be where sick folk. If, if you go to a hospital, there's not one sick person there. It's either good news or bad news. But here's the beautiful thing about this. When grandma found out that he was wounded for her transgressions, she got so excited. See, a transgression, I'm starting to get just a little bit hungry. I'm going to tell you the truth. A transgression is something that you've done wrong that you knew you shouldn't do, but you did it anyhow. Does anybody qualify for that? Yeah. Only five people in this whole room. <laughs> you knew you shouldn't have done it, but you said, I'm going to do it anyhow. And you did it, and you know you were wrong, and... That's a transgression. And we've all got them. But how many are wonderful, happy, excited for the fact that he said, paid in full? Yeah. Paid in full. How, how can that be? How can a just God let it all slide? Because it was paid for. Nobody got away with anything. Do you hear what I said? Yeah. Nobody got away with anything. The only difference is you didn't have to pay for it. You think about how wonderful that is. You, you know, it's kind of like my, my daddy used to tell this beautiful story about these two best friends, kind of like Brother Jim and I, growing up together. But they parted ways. One went off to college. The other went off into the military. And then they never heard from each other. And the man went to college and then became a lawyer and, and then became a, uh, a great judge. And he's in the city one day, and he's there judging people as they're brought before him. And here comes a man, hair long and a beard, unrecognizable, just one of the outcasts of life. How many know what I'm talking about? Nobody cared about him. Nobody cared. And he committed a crime, something he should have done. And he's there, and he's brought in, and the public defenders can't defend him, and they can't get him off, and he's just as guilty as he can be. And the judge is listening, and he, and he says, he says, now, he said, this name is very familiar. He said, did you, Thomas Brown, he said, did, were you from Detroit? He said, yes, Your Honor. I was. He said, do you recognize me, Tom? This is Billy, Billy John, my best friend. We grew up together. They started talking about playing hooky. You remember when we broke into Sister, Moses, Mrs. Brown's house and got the brownies and all the things they'd done, got all done. Judge says, well, he said, I love you. I always thought about you, he said, but I got a job to do. So he said, this is going to be a $10,000 fine. And as the judge, I'm going to have to pronounce you guilty. How many know you're guilty? <laughs> he ain't getting out of it. I'm guilty. I've confessed it before the whole church once. Just guilty. <laughs> guilty. That's all I got. But the beautiful thing was is that the judge says, now just a minute. And he got down, and he took his little robe off. He laid down his gavel, 
And then he walked around and he put his arm around him. He said, but as your friend, he said, I, as a judge, I got to find you guilty. But as your friend, I'm going to pay the fine. Now, that's exactly, exactly. We are just as guilty and somebody said it right as sin. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the way to put it. Guilty as sin, but somebody was willing to pay the price for my transgressions. And I'm getting in by his grace. And when grandma received that beautiful, you know, I kind of going to call it the happy meal because Jesus said, eat all of me. Matter of fact, I sold this this morning. I think there was 30,000 disciples he had. He made that statement, unless you take it all. You, you, there's no life in you. You got to eat it all. When Jesus said that, they said, we're not into cannibalism, brother. We're moving on. And he is down to 12. Instantly, bang. You got to eat it all. So when my grandmother, when she found out that he was wounded for her transgressions and salvation was hers, she took that beautiful part of the package that I'm going to call the toy, the best part. And she never, ever stopped telling people about what Jesus did for her. Right? Take a ride. It was an I was one of my other siblings that went with her. Uh, we all had one trip to Tennessee. I had to go back and see the homeland. Jim went down. I went down. I was 15 years old. The worst time I ever had in my life. 35 miles an hour all the way to Tennessee <laughs> with a rambler that you push the button to make it go in 35. And then many stops along the way. And one of those stops was if she saw a chain gang. Remember years ago, you get down in the south, and you see men working on a chain gang. They were chained together and working on the highway. Chained together. And Grandma's putting along down there. She had a clergy sticker on the back of her car. <laughs> Everybody know that she was, going, she was what she was about. And she wasn't ordained by any church. I don't know where she got it. She ordered it through something. Got it. God ordained her. That's what she'd say. God ordained me. Well, what a character. But she'd be coming along and so excited about what she'd found. When she fell in love with Jesus, it was real, more real than you'll ever know. He can tell you the story, how it happened. His father was involved. But she was so in love with Jesus that my grandfather was jealous more time for Jesus than anybody else. That's all she wanted to talk about. But she'd be coming along and here be this chain with a gang of these hardened criminals. My grandmother would stop and she'd get out and she's had a beautiful little southern accent and little red hair and, and she'd come up to the guards. And many times there'd be black men, mostly in the south, all chained together. And she'd get out with her little southern drawl and the guard would say, can we help you, ma'am? She said, yeah. She said, I'm a minister, and I, I need to talk to these boys. They said, well, ma'am, these are the hard criminals. She told me, hard, that man over there killed a little girl. That one raped. That one murdered. These are hard, and these boys are well past anything to do with God. Maybe moving your, just get in your car. And she said, no. She said, and, she, and she'd had a way of the, her sweetness. If you ever knew her, she'd talk you into anything. Come here with Grandma. And she, she said, now you just sit these boys down. Just give me a few minutes. And she'd sit down. And in a few minutes, she'd be talking. And you'd see them big, hard-hearted men. Pretty soon, there'd be a tear. And the head would come down. And she shared this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful gift she got with everybody she met that he was ruined for your transgressions. And your sins don't have to go before you. They can be buried in the deepest sea, and heaven is yours forever. How many are thankful for that? But I believe this is a complete package. If you only come in here because you think you're going to make heaven someday and you're going to have to fight everything else the whole way along, you're really missing the boat because it is a complete package. Happy meal. So, he was, secondly, he was bruised for my iniquities. 
Iniquities are those things that get passed down from generation to generation to generation. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, they, now, I was the other day at a uh, meeting with a bunch of folks in the kind of business that I'm doing, and one of them has this whole program where you can go and they do your blood and some saliva, and they'll come back and they'll tell you every marker that you have in you for heart conditions and diabetes and cancer. Here, here it all is. Spell it all out for you. I believe in my heart that that's an iniquity if it's being passed down from generation to generation. Right? I believe with all my heart. If that thing is being passed down, whether it's a, a alcoholism or something like that, a, a habits, sickness, this thing that gets passed down. You know, my father at 57 years old had a massive heart attack. His father, we found out later, grandpa had heart attacks. My brother died of a heart attack. So I decided I'm, I, I'm going to look in this package and see if there's anything here about dealing with these things that are coming down upon generation to generation to generation to see if maybe they were broke 2,000 years ago. Because I don't believe we need to have this stuff passed down. As a matter of fact, I'm going to declare in faith, I'm 65 years old, two months, August 3rd. Now, don't forget my birthday, boy. Last year, you forgot. I, you forgot. You, and then your wife forgot. I just didn't want to give you anything. <laughs> it's stingy. 65 years old. But I'm, I'm going to declare that my heart is going to keep on going for a long time, very strong, Be, not because... Now, I think common sense is involved too, right? You can't say, he's my healer, run out in front of a bus and say, but he didn't heal me. Common sense is involved. But I also believe with all my heart that if he was also bruised for my iniquities, then the thing can be stopped right here with me. Because he said it's finished. Remember at the cross when he got done, he said something, it is finite, finished. Thirdly, he said he was chastised so that I could live a life of peace. How many know that there's a whole lot of stress in the world today? And the peace, the peace that we used to even have as a country is, is dissipated. Would you agree? And there's confusion and turmoil and arguments and you name it, it's going on everywhere around us. But I believe... That if we believe that we can live a life of peace. There is a peace that passes understanding. There's one thing that I will say from my father, many things, but one thing that I really appreciated about him. He lived a life pretty much of peace. He did. Nothing ever seemed to move him pretty much off kilter. Now, I wasn't a perfect man. But he, he kept his peace. And because I really believe that he understood that he said, I will keep you in perfect peace depending on where your mind is at. Has a lot to do with it. But if you keep your mind stayed towards me, I'll keep you in perfect peace. And I remember for years and years we were there in a little basement church with hardly a handful of people, and everybody talked about all these great things that were going to happen. And my father would take me out to this piece of property that he couldn't buy because they weren't going to sell it to him, but he was going to tell me how he was going to build on that property. Remember that old, I won't say his name, we could get out, I don't want his kids to get offended, but there was a doctor on this big piece of property. My dad wanted to buy it, and he said, he said, Reverend, over my dead body, will you ever put a church here? Well, the Lord took him on home early. <laughs> and over his dead body, Bruce Cahaley sold that property to my dad. And, we, and everything. And but when we used to go out to that property that wasn't his, that the man said he would never have, he would tell me what he was going to do on this property that wasn't his, that the man said he would never have. He said, over there, I'm going to build a gymnasium. We're going to build us a church there. I'm going to put a, uh, in the center there is going to be a prayer tower. And there's going to be underneath a children's church. Then over here, I'm going to put elderly housing. This whole field is going to be elderly housing. All this is going to happen. And I'll never forget the day that God gave us that land by a miracle. And we started building the church, the first church. And we'd have been about nine, maybe nine, ten weeks. And 
pretty much every penny the church had was into it. The foundation was up. They had, they had set the floor, and they were building the, the top roof with these huge, big trusses. They weighed 1,000 pounds apiece. There was 52 of these trusses. And I remember it was years ago, and I had a little job for an electrical company. I was going to work in the morning, and uh, I looked over there in this field, thinking all the times my dad came out there and said it was going to be this. And I thought, wow, it's already a miracle that we own the property. That's a miracle. The second miracle is there's the first building being built. I looked at it, the crane out there working, the men working, went to work, worked all day, came home. Drove up there, going by Route 6, looked over there to see how the progress was, and in the, in the field was empty. It was gone. The building was gone. One of the trusses had been moved accidentally. 52 of those trusses came down, 52,000 pounds, hit the floor, bounced all the braces out from under the floor. The whole thing disintegrated. This was a, this was a, a church that was going to see 600 people <laughs> right into the ground. It was gone. And 12 men rode that whole thing into the ground. And every penny was gone. Everything was gone. And I'll never forget, I drove home and I thought to myself, oh, my God, that might have just happened. And I got into the house. And I went to my father's room and he's in the shower and taking a shower. And he's singing this. Remember the song we used to sing? We're singing all new songs now. We're going to talk about that someday. I like those old songs. I want some old stuff. But anyhow, he's singing, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Okay. And he was, he was enjoying it. I said, he doesn't know anything about what happened out there. Because believe me, if he knew that everything he'd worked for all his life is laying in a hole, he would not be singing, this is the day. He'd be singing, it's Miller time. Or <laughs> something. Singing a different song. And I said, Dad, Dad. And he'd always call me Brother Dave. Brother Jim, we were never nothing more than that. Yes, Brother Dave. I said, Dad, are you aware that the church is? Yes. He said, what a miracle. What a miracle, Brother Dave. Nobody got hurt. Everything was okay. He said, and I've been talking here to the Lord, and he's given me a couple things I can do to build it bigger. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. And God turned that around. It's a miracle how that thing was finished. But here's the deal, folks. He took the chastisement. He took the wounds for my sin. You hear me? He was bruised. You, we don't so, see bruising is something that happened on the inside. We don't know how he was bruised. I'm talking about a real beating that a man took for you. The bruising, imagine if, if a doctor could have got down and, and they said, let's pull this, let's look at this, let's do an autopsy. Look at the bruising of his liver. Look how his heart was bruised. Look how his kidneys, look at the bruising this man took. Why would I not live in peace if he did that for me? I have a choice. Look at the holes, look at the holes, look how they pierced his hands. Look at his feet. My transgressions. And... I like the last part. You see, the Happy Meal has four parts. Salvation. <laughs> it's actually a fish. I never did look at the toy. It's a little fish today. There's my piece. Transgressions, iniquities, peace. By his stripes, I'm healed. How many would say with me today, I need a healing? Lift your hand. A healing in my physical body. I need a healing. Okay, leave your hand up. And I want you to put another hand up if you say, I need a healing in my emotions. I'm, I'm okay. I look strong and healthy, but things are going on. How many would say, I need, I need a healing in my marriage, my relationship? We got almost every hand. Let's keep going, right? <laughs> How many need something somewhere? It's in the package. How many hear what I'm saying? It's in the package. You know, I, I, not to bring anybody down, but I, I, I have a wonderful job. 
but it's probably not fun to talk about, but it's still a wonderful job. And Stephanie works with me, and we help people make their plans for someday when they die. How many know you're going to die someday? How many are ready to go? I'm, I got two plans. I got a plan of salvation. So when I get there, I also got my cremation in place so my wife doesn't get messed up someday by somebody that's not honest. So I'm, pl- I got, I'm ready. When he tells me, I'm ready to go. But we put together a package. When you come in to see me, you say, uh, Brother Miner here, I, I heard you talking about prearranging, and so I need to get this done. Well, we got to put together a package because I can't just pick you up, right? Because I'm going to have to refrigerate for a while. So we're going to have to put that in the package, right? So that's here, not to bring it down, but to make an example, he didn't leave anything out. If there's anything you're lacking today, it's because you left it on the table. He didn't leave it on the table. He didn't say it's only salvation. You know, some folks, I've talked to people, and I've said, I'd like to pray for you, for your healing. They say, well, I don't believe in healing. You believe in he- Oh, yeah, I believe. I'm, I'm saved. I don't believe God heals today. Well, then you just, you just left it there. All you got is the toy, and the toy is wonderful. That's all you took. It's a complete, absolute package that he did for you and I. We have a choice to receive it or not. So how do I, how do I receive it? How many know that we ha- the scripture says, and I thought of this the other night, I was praying, and I thought of this scripture. He said, when, you, when, when we're going to receive something, we're going to lift our hands, right? But you must lift your hands without two things. They got, this has got to be missing from, from, from our expectation. Number one, you can't lift your hands in wrath. I've said that a thousand times. Prayed it. Lord, we don't lift our hands in wrath. I didn't even know what I was saying. How many have ever been angry at God? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm not your pastor. I'm just one of you. So you can just talk to me. He ain't looking. Danny ain't looking. Nobody's looking. How many have been upset with God a few times? I've cussed him out once or twice. Oh, no, age, what, no, go, what? I got to put my grandfather, I guess. You know, I, I, I've been a hundred times to Romania. How about, when you, how about when you take a whole bus load, of, of, of a van load of medicine to JFK, and they put it on the airplane for you, Delta said, because I'm going on a mission trip and taking all this medicine to children. How about when they say, well, we're going to do it for free, how about when you get over to Budapest where you've already rented the van that's supposed to be there and the guy rented it to somebody else and you don't have a van? How about when they tell you this is a communist country, we've been out of Kazakhstan in two years and there's only four vans that are allowed to leave the country and you will not get a van to deliver this medicine to children? How about then you get upset at God? And you ha- it started, the conversation started out gentle at first. I said, no, Lord, you know, I'm here trying to help the children. And in Jesus' name, now I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm going to go to the next place, and I'm going to the next place. And I went to five places on this old airport in Budapest, Hungary. Nobody's speaking English. Nobody's speaking English. Hungarian and Russian, few people speaking English. And everybody said, no, 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 you will not get a van. So I got these boxes of medicine. I'm sitting there, and I got angry at God. I said, now just what in the... Blank is going on around here because I'm here trying to help people. Now, if I was over here at the disco chasing women around, then I guess that the, it's a little different story. But I came to help people, and I'm here with this stuff, and you are not helping me the least bit. And I had wrath at God. How many know when you lift your hand up that way, you're not going to receive much? <laughs> you ain't going to receive much from your wife or your husband you get that way. You're not, it's just because the scripture says you lift your hands to him without wrath. Are doubting. I mean, not only am I angry at God, I doubt you're going to do anything for me. You put that combination together, I promise you, you're leaving it on the table. So, I, about an hour of being angry, and I thought to myself, I said, this isn't working. And I'm in a mess. The only one that can get me out of this mess, I'm trash talking. <laughs> the only one. Nobody's there. There's Earl Roberts, Billy Graham, A.A. Allen, David Miner Sr., nobody. Just me. I went alone. Stupid me. Alone. 
And the only one that could save me, I'm talking bad about. So I stopped. And I said, Lord, I'm just desperate as a desperate can be. If you look at the word desperate in the dictionary, you're going to see my picture. <laughs> I need your help. I'm going to believe you're going to do something for me. I'll never forget it. If I lived to be a million years old, a fellow comes up to me in English, not Hungarian, not Russian. He said, excuse me, sir, you need a van? <laughs> Is there a guidepost magazine around here? Uh, yeah. He said, I have one out here. Let me show you. Walked out there. i never forget it. It was red. It was a Fiat diesel van. There you go. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you? He said, well, hey, somebody's over here at the counter mentioned. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, how much, right? He said, give me whatever you think's right. I'm like, okay, here's $700. It was going to pay me a lot more at the other place. I said, is that good for you? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, uh, he said, here's the key. I'm still in confusion today. Here's the key on my life. Here's the key. He turned around and walked away in the crowd. I'm there with the key. How many know that sometimes when God delivers you, even you're shocked? Yeah. I'm looking at the key. I'm thinking, man, I get in there. I get everything loaded. I start driving. I knew the way. How many know that when God blesses you and delivers you, then your carnal mind? That's what I'm talking about. See, God wants to do something for you today, and the devil's not your enemy. Oh, yes, he is. Of course he's your enemy. But he's probably not going to be chasing you around today. He's way too busy. Here's my problem right here. I got in that van. I start driving to the border. And the very first thing that my mind said to me. Now, I back then, I used to blame it on the devil. Because it preached better. The devil got in, strapped in the seatbelt, and said, I need to talk to you. That preach is good. But really what happened is I began to think, oh, my God. Maybe this is stolen van. <laughs> I mean... Perfect, right? You go to the airport. You hear some poor idiot American that needs a van desperately. You just walk up and say, here, here's a van. What do you give me? That's exactly what this is, a stolen van. So I get to the border, right? And here I am going into Romania from Budapest to open up the gate. And the guy stops the gate and they stop you. And he says, passport and papers for this vehicle and papers for the vehicle. <laughs> Nobody mentioned papers before, brother. The guy just handed me the key, and I'm looking in the glove box, and I pull out something looked like from McDonald's, and I said, here? <laughs> no, he said, no, no good. Could be stolen. You know why it could be stolen? Because by the time I got there, I had convinced myself it was stolen. Therefore, God had to honor my faith. <laughs> he always honors your faith. My faith is it's a stolen van, so when I got there, it was written right here, in Hungarian, stolen van. <laughs> so I turned around and started back to the airport. And listen, sometimes you've got to talk to yourself. David encouraged himself. You gotta talk. I, rem I had to think about God, and God's for me. He's not against me. I'm doing this. This is a good thing I'm doing. Now, hold on a second. I drove about eight miles, and I stopped, and I turned around. And I knew about 20 miles south, there's another border, on the border of Yugoslavia. I'm going down there, and I drove down there. I drove up to that border, but I changed my thought. I changed my thinking on the way down. I had 20 minutes to get it right. I was desperate. I had no choice but to believe God. There, I had no other option but to get some faith going in my heart. And when I got there, I had convinced myself this van was given to me by God, by a miracle. I'll testify some years from now. I'll preach at Pastor Jim Miner's church, and I'll tell them how God gave me this van. And I'm going to declare it. And in Jesus' name, I drove in there. And this time, the guy said, give me a passport, and never even asked me for a piece of paper. Because he's for us. He's not against us. And the only thing in the world that's going to limit whether or not you receive everything that's in this happy meal is you. The only one. The only one. The only one that can rob you is you. The devil can't rob you. He's given every power and every authority that you'll ever need. It's been given through Christ. And you can't read another book 
that's going to do anything more that's already been done for you. But it all hinges on our, 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 our willingness to believe because every man has been given faith. I've told you that before and I'm almost done. Every one of us has already been granted faith. You got it when you were born. Scripture says, it doesn't say every Christian, it says every man. Read it. Every man, I don't care what color, it doesn't matter. Every man has been given a measure of faith. What you do with that faith is up to you. How you develop that faith, how you cause it to grow, how you cause it to make a difference. In it, that's all going to be up to you. And the things you can achieve, that's all going to be up to you. But everything that you need is already on the table. All you need to do is go back and get it. I'm going to close with this. Uh, a few, few, maybe a month or so ago, once in a while, just somebody will come to my mind. Anybody ever just come to your mind, you call them on the phone. Just call them on the phone. This Debbie Shepherd, I call her on the phone up in Pennsylvania, my church many years. Debbie, how you doing? Not good. Not good. She said, I got out of bed this morning and stepped wrong. And she said, I don't know what it is. Something happened. I can't even put my foot down. My husband's coming home to bring me to the hospital. So he picked her up. And I said, now, listen, Debbie. I said, listen. And listen, I want, you, I want you to hear this, folks. I want you to hear me very clear. Jesus is not going to heal one more person. Not one more. Not one. Because... It's already in the package. You, you, you just, <laughs> listen, the toy, salvation, that's the best part. I get it. I get it. I get it. I, I get it's free. I, I can't earn it. I, but, but there's some more things in the package for you. So we're wasting a whole lot of time trying to get you healed because you don't believe. Really, what we should pray, I should, we should never have to pray for your healing. We should pray like Jesus prayed for Peter, your faith. Be stronger than it is. Because your healing has already taken place. How many understand that? If by his stripes we're healed, then it already happened. It'd be like asking him to go back to the cross brand new today when somebody wants to get saved. Right? Right? We can't go back and do it. It's already been done. So the only thing that's keeping us from receiving it is unbelief. That's, that's a tough one, right? And I'm talking to you as an everyday guy. I'm not talking to you as some great preacher. I'm talking to you every unbelief. We just can't believe. We can't believe. We can't move the needle from doubt to faith. And if you can tip that thing just a little bit, how many hear what I'm saying? It's like a scale. Just a, just, just a little tip will start the process moving because you've got to understand that you've already received it. I think I shared this before. I'm going to close with this. This is my last. You know, you get three closings. <laughs> it's my last closing. And I think I might have shared this before, but I did this morning. I want to share it with you again because I think it's so important. Whatever, whatever, let me, let me finish Debbie. So Debbie shattered something, right? She goes to the doctor. He takes an x-ray. And she told me he's, he's not a man that believes in God. And he said, you've messed up your tendon in such a way that I didn't even know how I'm going to fix it. It's going to be major, major. And when I talked to her on the phone, she said something really bad has happened to my foot. I said, don't say that. Don't speak it. Don't own it. Whatever he says, don't own it. We're going to believe that we're just simply going back to get the rest of the Happy Meal. Sorry, I left this on the counter. Sorry, this was mine. This is, this, we're going back to get it. So I called her maybe four days later. I said, Debbie, give me the report. She said, swollen, cast. As soon as it goes down, I go to the doctor. Goes to the doctor takes the cast off, does an MRI, comes back, says something's wrong. I don't understand this. There's nothing wrong with your tendon. And she said, would you call this a miracle? Because she said, what do I say? She knew she was getting it. What do I say? 
I said, just let him call. He said, no, I'd call it as um, unexplainable. I'll take it. By his stripes, I'm healed. So I really believe that a few weeks later, I was in Cattersport, and guess who was dancing across the front of that church on that shattered tendon? Why her? Do you, I, think, I think the story would have been different if she'd have walked in there and agreed with the doctor. If she, oh yeah, when can we do the operation? You see, it's not that he wasn't presenting the facts. He just didn't know the truth. There is a difference. He, he had the facts right. Yep, you got the facts right. When Bill Halderman was sick, dying, you got the facts right on the cancer. Here's the deal. The truth is this. By his stripes, I'm healed. Facts are men don't walk on water. I haven't seen any. But the truth is, one day he did it. Because he's the truth. So, so accept the facts or accept the truth that when he said it was finished, there wasn't one thing he left undone.